Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Barry Kostransky. These are artist talks that I host every Tuesday night. Um, tonight, the 7th, we have Judith Margolis, who is Zooming in from Wednesday. She'll be speaking to us from the future. As she's in Jerusalem, Israel. Sure. And it is Wednesday, 1 a.m. So yeah. sort of the advantage of using technology. These talks are recorded. The last talk and all the previous talks are on my uh, YouTube channel, which you can access through my website. Uh, our format, we have Mo Kelly modeling. Everybody is welcome to draw. And, uh, you know, the idea here is, can you engage multiple activities? Do they feed each other? Do they hinder each other? Can you, can listening open up seeing? Um, it's an interesting quest. Sometimes it works for me and sometimes it doesn't, but I, I enjoy doing it very much. And of course, we would, Judith will eventually screen share. And so Mo, the model will be this large on your screen. And it is such a challenge to try and capture the movement when seeing so little. And, you know, maybe that's a good test too. Nice to see so many of our regulars. Next week on the 14th, we have open discourse. And then the week after I'm on vacation, five months honeymoon revisit, hmm. DR. Kathy and I are going to the Dominican Republic for a getaway. Um, uh, I know there's a, an opening. I just want to mention this quickly. I think Friday night is an opening in New York City uh, Museum del Barrio and the project space. I may be paraphrasing it wrong, but something like 60 women um, uh, contemporary artists. And I think many who are in this group and groups that I've been a part of are actually exhibiting in that show. So something to think about. Um, Judith, I'm going to hand it over to you. I want to thank you for your time and for coming in so late at night. Thanks to all the regulars who come so regularly and all the new faces that I see. Um, uh, again, Mo models uh, on her own, of course. If anybody would like to contribute, you can reach out to me or directly to Mo if you can see her contact info. Judith, I'll say share screen. We look forward to hearing. Judith, uh, as she mentioned, as we were chatting a little earlier, yes, she's from Jerusalem, but like half the people there, she was originally born in the Bronx. <laughs> can you see what I shared? Yes, yes that was okay. very quick. Well done. Okay. So uh, the basis for what I want to talk about tonight, I, I, I warn Barry, I'm I'm older and I have a lot of work, so I, I don't want to try to do too much. I love books and I love old books. And I ended up over the years making books, making artist books and taking books that are found and doing things with them. And the reason I'm showing this is I just recently um, published a book called Praise Emptiness. I'm, let me just say, I found this, this book, it's an old book and that's the inside. It's from 1888. It says on the spine, it's some kind of a voyage um, encyclopedia thing. And I saved it for a long time because I really felt like I would do something with it. And I ended up, I must have found it about 10 years ago. And somebody came to me, a friend of mine who, who I knew for many years and who's a patron of mine. I'm going to make this a little smaller. And he gave me a manuscript that he had written called Praise Emptiness. He's a religious, he's a, he's a observant Jew who's, a, who's an agnostic, who doesn't, isn't sure about God. And he wrote essays over a period of time about this. And he called it Praise Emptiness. And he said he wanted me to design a book for him. He's a patron of mine. He has a lot of my work and he's bought some of my elaborate books. So he knew what he was getting into. He lives in LA, by the way. And he gave me the manuscript at the end of um, 2019 and then Corona started. So I had the book to work on while, um, while we were locked away. This is, the, so I reproduced the cover. If you can see here, I used that old book for the cover. All of the titles of the, of the book and also the chapters are hand-drawn. I went to Cooper Union right out of high school and I studied with Paul Standard, who was a wonderful calligrapher and a very much, um, very inspiring to me. And I never had a chance to quite do this, but you'll see what I mean. All of the titles and chapters are hand-drawn. So what happened was I ended up using so much of, he said that he wanted me to use my art to accompany his 
chapters, which are essays. They're not illustrations, but they accompany. And um, I ended up using so much art that he changed the title of the book to Praise Emptiness, Essays, Verbal and Visual. The name of the uh, publishing company, Bright Idea Books, is my company. And I've published limited editions, um, sometimes for other people and usually my work. This is the author. I had visited him in, um, in December of 2019 when he gave me the manuscript and I was standing outside his kitchen window and I took a picture of him. And that's my art on his, uh... can you see that if I, if I no, point? We're no. no, we're still on that first book image. Are you kidding me? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So wait a minute, how do I get to, um... I'm really sorry about that. How do I get so to the yellow, new... yellow that Zoom share? Wait a minute. No, you're already on Zoom share. The yellow image, you gotta just lose that uh window that's open with the two books. Uh okay. I'm trying to figure out how to do that. Sorry about that. So all that time I was talking, um I know I got lost in the drawing. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. The problem is I let's see if I can get it. Uh oh. Hmm. That's okay. It's okay. We're we're, we're patient. Okay. Judith, if you go out of screen share and then yeah, come so back out. into screen share, pick the page that you want to show. So okay. exactly, exactly. Go out of screen okay. share. There you go. I'll come back in screen share, but now pick the page that you want to show us. Okay. Wait a minute. <laughs> okay. Sorry let that that share All that time I was talking, I thought you were seeing the book. Okay. We were listening. Here we go. Is that better? Share. Share screen. And now, there yeah. You go. Praise of okay. that. That's yeah. This is the book. <laughs> yep. This you got 95 book. pages. Okay. And these are the these are the titles and uh, hand drawn. But you could see that I used that that old book as the um, now my publisher. His name is Yair Medina, and he's with Jerusalem Fine Art Prints, and he's a preeminent digital printer. When they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. He was given the job of doing minutes. the okay. facsimile. Can you see this that I'm moving the pages? Yes, yeah. yes, okay. that's working. So when I was talking about the uh, calligraphy, this is this is what I do. I hand drew. Um, so it's yeah. It's and we have at six thirty. Bright Idea Books is my company, and there's the author sitting in his kitchen. Uh, when I took this picture, I had no idea that I was going to be doing a book for him, but this turned out to be a really good, um, he's an entrepreneur and a, and a philanthropist and hadn't published anything before. So the table of contents are such, objective pluralism, Leibowitz one, praise emptiness, unhappiness. The, the, the titles of the chapters are all about this very, it's very heavy intellectual and searching material. And I thought that the hand-drawn titles would give it a little um, pizzazz, like you'll see what I mean. The introduction is written by a classicist professor, a professor of classics named Jonathan Price from Tel Aviv University. And this is one of the first paintings in it. This is called Simple Twist of Fate. And this is an, this is an image that you will see a lot. Um, can you see this moving or not? It's not moving, but I, I yes, I see your cursor, yes. Yeah, that's what I meant. So what looks like dice are in fact a schematic drawing of a concept that in the upper heavens, when the light comes from six different directions and where that meets the energy and light, it affects what goes on down on earth. The expression as above, so below comes from this. So I the draw the, the painting is of when I what I wanted to talk very much about is synchronicity and how things seem to be by chance, but in my experience, that's not the case. And uh, my experience in this particular case was I had gone into the studio to draw after having been, my husband died in 2005, and I didn't work in my studio for quite a while. And I finally, after a very long time, went in and I did a drawing of a woman kind of thrown back in the chair. And the next day I went to the beach with my family and we stayed out overnight. And it turned out that there was a terrorist attack in Jerusalem. And when I came back to Jerusalem to my studio, I remembered that I had done this drawing without knowing what was gonna happen. And I have the hand casting these 
these images, they're not dice, but they're, they indicate that what is, happens isn't random chance, that things are destined. Uh, I question it all the time. So here's the first chapter, Objective Pluralism. Uh, here's, an ex here's a collage. At the time that I did this collage, one of the things I love about this book is that the work that I drew upon to use is from my entire adult life. And some of them are very old. Uh, this one wasn't that long ago, it was 1986, I think. I, didn't, I don't think I even knew what dialectic meant then, but uh, now I do. That's one of those words I have to look up every time I hear it. Interestingly, underneath it, it says vulnerability acceptance, which I find is a really important aspect of, uh, of life. So this is an image. The, des the design makes the uh, footnotes on the side very easy to access. Here's another example. So what I've done is draw upon different times of my life and different works. I have a body of work called on the road. And this is a page from that book. I traveled for about seven or eight years with this one particular um, sketchbook. And I used the pages to do collages. And I only did it while I was traveling. This is a collage. It says, as blue as snow is Paul like clay. And it's actually from 1964 when I was, um, I, I was still at Cooper Union then, and I was reading a lot of Herman Hesse, and this is a quote from one of his books, and it's a collage. I don't even understand, I didn't even understand what I was doing, and I had no idea why I did it that way, and I didn't have any teacher particularly to say what I was doing. So it's very comforting to me now that after all these years, I get to use the work. This is the uh, title I wanted to show you about. The hand-drawn titles. Now, if you were reading a book and you came across a chapter called Unhappiness, you wouldn't necessarily want to delve right in, but I felt like the hand-drawn titles um, are inviting. This is, the, the drawing is called War, Where Thoughts Gather. Uh, in a way, the book ends up being a really interesting showcase of my work because it shows the range. I draw a huge amount. Drawing is really important to me. Uh, collage, painting. Here's another page from uh, uh, On the Road. Okay. I think uh, there's one particular painting I wanted to get to. I'm, I'm gonna try not to go too fast. Ah, so this one, this is called Keyed to the Sound. Um, and as I said, I draw a lot and I often, have models pose for me. And I did this when I was living in Los Angeles. It's in the uh, mid eighties. I was had just finished graduate school at USC. And the, the, the nature of media and the film industry, there was a huge amount of sexual violence being depicted um, in movies. And also it seemed to me in advertisements for clothing and I remember an ad for a, a, a fur coat and, and it looked like the woman who was wearing the coat was being whipped. Um, so I started to, to respond to that and I tried to understand about how sexuality becomes violent. And I had my models pose for me and this is a drawing from that series. It's one of my favorite drawings. They're very large, the, the, these works. And there's when you another, say very large, you're talking three feet, four feet? Uh, well, this, this particular one is about four feet by five feet, but there's a painting I'm going to be showing you that's actually, I think it's 10 feet by seven feet, but we're going to get there. Um, Judith, where did you study uh, art history? Or okay, art so I, I studied at Cooper Union. Well, actually, I started to go to classes at uh, the Art Students League. I when I was 14, 15 years old, I lived in New Jersey. We left the Bronx, we moved to New Jersey. And my father kindly lied on the, you know, on my application to go there. He said I was 18 when I was only 15 so that I could be in the uh, new drawing class. Now, this is a painting called Splendor in the Grass Bitburg. And um, I don't think I want that there. Um, 
In 1984 or 85, President Reagan went to Germany on a diplomatic tour and he went to a cemetery in Bitburg and he inadvertently, he said, laid a, a wreath on the grave of an SS soldier. And he came back and the next week at the White House, Eli Wiesel was speaking and getting some kind of an award. And he spoke out about it and he said, you know, that's not right. And we have to remember what happened. There was a photograph in um, Newsweek of Reagan walking across the cemetery with his advisors. And in the place where the figures are were these gravestones of, uh, of people either lost in the, in the Holocaust and the Shoah or it was hard to tell who the gravestone was, but I replaced the gravestone with the rape. And it was a, a way to respond to the idea of what, what do we think about history? So this painting is um, seven feet by six feet, something like that, quite large. It's owned by the Skirball Museum in Los Angeles and it's never been exhibited. They bought it then and they never exhibited it. Uh, it's been published now in this book and also a book by someone who did it, a book about art about the Holocaust and it, it's just getting coming out this year in that too. So I thought that was interesting. I, as somebody who's older, an older artist who's been working a long time, I feel like the, the lessons I've learned about being patient is really important. This is called uh, Nursing and Drawing. It's from 1978 when I had my, my youngest child. The name of that chapter is The Body. So I put that there. Okay, I think that this is good. I'm gonna get rid of this now. Okay. Can you still see my screen? Yes, but I have a feeling as uh, now I have to saying, you may have to quit and go in again. But because right now we still see the book. Okay. Oh, there we go, now you quit. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm gonna go here. Okay. Good, well done. Okay. Now this is another book. Now, this is. The book that I just showed you, Praise Emptiness, I worked on for three years. It was published in a limited edition. It's going, we're going to be making a trade edition, a paperback trade edition, but it was, you know, graphic, graphic technicians worked on it. It was published. This is a one of a kind book, meaning unique. I work in it. I have many books like this and I work on them over time. And this one began in an already, it was like a, a sketchbook. It's quite thick and it had nice paper. Uh, and let's see, you're seeing this change, right? Yes. Okay, good. So this is very stream of consciousness. I don't even know from one page to the next what I'm gonna be doing with this. And so you're, you're seeing a variety of, of, I call it now, not now. And I believe I called it that because of anxiety and worry about whether I'm working, whether what I'm doing is the right thing. Um, I'm sure no, none of you have ever had any feelings like this at all about your art or about your life, but um, I'm always, I'm often thinking I don't do enough and I'm too lazy and I don't accomplish anything. So the, uh, the image on the left here, um, it's, that's actually a Xerox of a page from another book of mine. And it says in Russian, abundance of time. I had a, a grant to go to Russia for a few weeks and I worked on um, etchings and lithography there. And, and this is from one of those uh, books. And um, the image of the clock actually features in a lot of my work. My father died at this hour that you could see. And according to the nurse who was with him, who sat up with him the night before he died, he said, I, I lived a long and happy life and I did everything I wanted to do. This is what she told me. I, I, I'm, I'm believing her. So I use that image sometimes as a reminder. This is an example of the kind of pages that are in this. It's a fairly small book. It's about um, six inches by six inches each page. So it's 12 inches across. And I use both collage and drawn images and writing and whatever I think of. And in this particular case, I feel that each page is almost like a, um, a little story. Mm. 
you could see where I work. I have a few things going at once. And then this would be that, that page. Judith, uh, you know, when you mentioned synchronicity, Carl Young comes to mind and his, yeah. his name has been brought up so many times uh, during the talks that we've held here. And seeing a book like this, the Red Book often comes up. Are you familiar with Carl Young's Red I Book? I am. And I was lucky enough to be in New York when it was on exhibit at the Rubin Museum. But I found out that you could download it for free on the, from the internet if you want to look at it ever. I mean, I would have bought one if I thought of it, but <laughs> they had a facsimile that they were selling. Um, Do you ever draw from your dreams? Where does your, you mentioned yes. where some of your imagery comes from. Yes. Where some of your other imagery comes, comes from, from everywhere. In fact, I think of collage as being like dreaming. You know, when you, when you do a collage, you take an image of something that you found and maybe a photograph you took, and then you have a memory and then something that happened that day. And it's this combination of things that come together in a way that, in a new way that makes sense. And that's really how we dream of taking images and, and memories and parts of things from, so um, here's another one. I like that description of collage. I like yeah. that. Uh, it says, sometimes I, it says here, she explores the mystery and the absurdity of the human condition in order to enhance our powers of self-reflection. And then at the, on the lower bottom right hand, it says, while still looking for a home. I was moving and I was looking for a place to live. And so I did that during that time. I, I, I embed messages about my personal life in my-, in my uh, Can you put that one back up on the screen a sec? Sure. You know, David Gregory, I was just looking at your painting in my studio where you took all the typeface and you put it on. See the similarity? to uh, this, to the piece that you did? I do, I, I, I uh, yeah, I don't know. Is that a stencil or letter set? I use- This, this is a stencil. I, I do have a huge collection of old letter set stuff. Yeah. I have not I used it so much. I have a lot of stencils. Yeah. I have a lot of, um, I just cut things out. And I also like to hand draw. So um, yeah. I use whatever's around. Yeah, I, 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 I love working with it. It goes bad. The letter set. Well, that's why I stopped using it. But uh, yeah. this is, uh, yeah. Could not done it. Yeah, cool. This is one that I did recently. It says uh, a place I once lived for a short while, and this part, which is from um, you know, the collage of the of the, I use snakes a lot. I have a very good feeling about snakes. I think of it as like energy, energy snakes and things hidden. But there's also the danger that we all associate with snakes, and so. I was trying, I don't know. I mean, I don't give it thought. I don't think about these things. I do them and they they kind of tell me what they need and then they they appear. Um, and I reuse images a lot. This part here, which looks like uh, something drawn of a, um, a bush, you know, of leaves. It's from another drawing entirely. I'll make Xeroxes of things and then reuse it. And this house is, a, is from an etching that I did. Think is that it? No, there's still more. Um, this particular drawing of the hand, it's actually a hand. My husband, David died in 2005 and he was a writer and we were very much soulmates. And I have trillions of drawings of him and his body parts. And I find particularly his hand, I like including his hand in things. And this is, this is just the last page uh, on the back. It says, the end, red hots, to be soon continued. It's actually not done yet, but I did this at some point. So, okay. Now I'm gonna stop share. Did that stop or did it not it stop? Did. No, you're, you're a master at this now. I'm getting better now. Okay, so <laughs> let me find another part. Um, here we go. Huh. Ah, okay, this is exciting. I hope. Uh, where do I start? Do I have to? 
You didn't you didn't share screen. Yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna share screen. Here we go. Okay. Night and day. So um yeah, these are two these are paintings. Um I I have work in a show, I have work opening in a show on Sunday in Italy. And I was invited, I'm part of a woman's data database of artists called Windmill. And they we were invited to contribute work on a particular Greek myth, Circe and Ulysses. And I took work that I had done for another purpose and I changed it. The, the mandate was to do a diptych and it had to be a certain size. And, but I started out with a painting. Now I, I come from Jewish tradition, um, the Shekhinah, which is the feminine aspect of, of God is something that inspires me. Or when I do images of the female body, I'm often thinking of the sacredness of that. And a lot of the paintings that I did were, were from there. In this particular one, it's called Night and Day. And Circe is referred to as the uh, daughter of Night and Day. So I thought that was wonderful to be able to use this. And the hands are collaged from an, years ago, I was the first person I knew to have a fax machine when we moved to Jerusalem. And a friend of mine asked if she could have something faxed. And it was a, it was a book, uh, it was a page of Thai massage with these hands doing different things. So I made a Xerox of it and I've been using it over and over again in different sizes for years. Um, and my idea in this particular image is that throughout the day and night, there's unseen hands guiding us in, in the world, not necessarily guiding us, but maybe shaping what happens. And I tried in this painting to um, have a, a source of light. You can't see the source of light, but you can see the light. This is all, this is all happening. Um, this, this round thing is actually a round um, time, time chart years ago it must have been like 1972 or something there was a, a, a hospital in L I was living in San Francisco and they, they closed the hospital and they were they were auctioning off the contents and I got a job being a guard of one of the rooms for for their auction I was you know an hourly job and they were throwing away these things it turns out the room I was in was the tiled room where they did experiments on animals and they had these round charts. And so I just took a bunch of them and I've been using them for collage ever since. So there's that. And this, this one, I call this inside and outside. And um, the original painting was done. I was living in LA at the time and there was a murder that was reported. They said, actually the murder happened in San Francisco. They said that they, a man had set up a little tent and lived in it for a few days. And they found the body of a woman whose head was cut off and her heart was cut out. And I, I was very taken by this article. And I ended up doing many, many paintings of tents and people in tents and women out of the tents. And it was during that time that I did that other um, drawing of the couple, like figurative drawing, but examining the relationship between men and women and sexuality and violence and all that kind of thing. The paintings that I did, like this one, ended up inexplicably, for me, feeling very spiritual and not violent. I, it was inspired by something, but I, it became different. So this is a painting from quite a long time ago. And I ended up- I'd have to agree, Judith, you get a great feeling of an aura of a person down below. You know, yeah. maybe by it being negative out and highly lit compared to that shadowy object. Yeah. So, so both of these, a contrast there. Both of these are quite large, but the mandate for the diptych that I was supposed to do is that they have to be, each one has to be 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters, which is not that large. Anyway, I'm going to go to another place now. Let's see if I could find what I want to find. Hold on. Um, sorry about this. Well, that's okay. The model is now two inches by three inches on my screen, and it's so much easier to draw. I lost the uh, I lost the thing where it says talking about uh, things for the artist talk. Okay, here we go. Um, <clears throat> and then when you're ready, share screen. Yes, that's what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to do that. Sorry, got this. Whoops. Okay. Um, I will offer while you're doing that, Judith, one little trick I do when I'm drawing sometimes when I abstract towards the end, I look and I say, do the lines on the outside converge or do they uh, move apart? You know, very basic difference in a line. Does the form come together or go away? And then I exaggerate that. And then I get to the point where the next shape change. And if it's, let's say, all of a sudden now, instead of converging, the form moves out. And by playing just, just very definitely showing the difference between the lines, I get some great perspective plays and you can encapsulate a figure because it is these transitions where if you look at Mo's shoulder, it's wider, then it gets narrower and it narrows by her elbow to her, her uh, wrist. And then at the wrist, it goes out. So it's, if it's as simple as just marking the changes, you can get very dramatic imagery and you can sort of understand what Picasso did and why it works so well. Um, it, it's, it's just the, it's reduction at its best. And I think working strong. Okay. We see that now. I, see I appreciate the... that very much. <laughs> okay, so this is the diptych. Now, what I did was I took my paintings, which were quite large, and I, I have them scanned beautifully, and I reduced them in size. And I have, a I have a huge collection of old, old books. And I found an old book from 1850 that had this decorative border around. It was actually a different shape, but I changed it in Photoshop. And basically in Photoshop, I created this diptych. Now, what I love about the idea of fusion is the, the, the piece is supposed to be about this Greek myth. But the fact is, is that I started with something that it wouldn't be too obvious perhaps, but I'm inspired by, uh, Kabbalistic or, or, or Torah tradition. And the border is from a book that suggests a Christian decorative thing because it's a diptych. I associate diptychs and these small iconic images with, with Christian uh, religious practice. So I felt like I got to take it all in and make it be this piece. And I'm really happy with it. So, um, and it was completely unexpected. You know, when I, when I first approached it, I didn't know what I was gonna be doing. If anybody has any question, everybody's very quiet. Is that a good thing? <laughs> uh, okay. Our, our group, uh, sometimes when you're listening, you, you're not provoking questions, maybe at the end. People will. Okay. I'm, open, I'm open to any question. So far, nobody. I asked Barry before we spoke, was there anything that I couldn't show or say? Because of, you could tell from the nude image, perhaps, or one thing that is not, I'm not uh, uh, religiously observant in that way anymore, but I was basically Orthodox for 25 years. And during the time I was doing a lot of this work was when I was. And it caused a tremendous kind of uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Steinfeld's uh, Worlds Colliding. That was definitely a Worlds Colliding. And so, um, okay, so I'm gonna, is it, I'm gonna take this away now. Okay. And how are we doing on time? You're fine, it's 6.41, we're doing fine. Okay. Um, I'm trying to find the next, there was another batch of stuff. Uh, Ah, the video. I think I should show that. That's a good idea. Okay. Now, let me see how I can do this. I have to bring in the Vimeo thing, and I'm going to have to put it in. Hold on for a second. Okay. You could tell them something while I'm doing this. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Jen, Jen, I was curious, do you know about that exhibit opening for the Museum del Barrio this Friday? I think it's 60 Contemporary Women. Uh, yeah, I'm in it. <laughs> That's what I thought. So I mentioned it earlier. Oh, um, good. Thank are you. you going to the opening? Yes. 
I think I'm gonna. I'm, I think I'm gonna go as well. I figure oh, I, I can meet like 20 people I've wanted to meet all at. I time. know. Yeah, it, it's these yeah. kind of things are good when um, you know, and then you get to finally see people again and say hello. Yes. Okay. Now the problem is I can't do a full screen and then be able to. So do the small screen. Do the small. Yeah, my project. Can you see family can you secrets? This? My brother was Wait the first born. You can't see this, can you? No, you didn't share screen yet. Okay. No, my sister Wait a minute. was born. Okay. Not a problem. Okay, hold on for a sec. I have to find where I can share the screen again. Oh, this is really annoying. Okay, I think I, I'm almost there. Share screen. Here we go. Judith, do you still consider yourself yourself orthodox? No, not at all. <laughs> no, I'm 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 definitely deeply engaged, but um, one of the things I I you know how you have to write a um, you have to write a, a an artist bio or something like that, and I'll say that I'm deeply engaged. In, in exploring the tension between feminism and spirituality and religion, uh, especially, but not only in Judaism. So I would say that that kind of represents where I am. I'm kind of like, you know what? I'll tell you something. In Hebrew, there's an expression called ezer kenegdo, which means a worthy opponent. And I used to use this expression when I thought about being married that, um, we find in our spouse a worthy opponent, right? And so I think I'm, I kind of, for me, religion is a kind of worthy opponent. <laughs> anyway, here we go. Can you see this now? I will mm -hmm. say that is, that is one interesting way to look at a relationship as a <laughs> worthy opponent. Worthy whether opponent well, my, I, was married, I was married twice to two really good guys. And the second time we were together for 35 years, and he was a he was a he was a writer also. So you know, we had our we each had our other lover. We used to say, you know, he had his writing and I had my art. But um, we argued a lot. What can I tell you? Okay, so this <laughs> now, how do I start this? Here we go. Yeah, press the yeah. name yeah. of my project is Family Secrets. My brother was the firstborn. Then my sister was born and she was diagnosed with Down syndrome. When my mother was pregnant with me, she was institutionalized and put away in a place called Willowbrook. No one ever told me. I didn't know she was my sister for a really long time. How do we become the unique person we are meant to be. I am the only one left in my family of origin. Are the secrets mine to tell? I came to recognize the pervasive anxiety and sadness that seemed to accompany me no matter what else was happening. I don't blame my parents. They did the best they could with what was given them. What I do regret is the tyranny secrecy. No one ever told me what was true. I learned to draw when I was very young. Being an artist saved my life. It gave me an arena in which to examine all these difficult things creatively. I finally felt ready to face fear and sadness and look at what had happened to my sister and our family. One needs support and guidance to do hard things. And most of all, you have to trust your intuition. I had the idea to make a timeline in order to look carefully at everything that had happened. I started with words, plotting the chronology from my brother's birth to my sister's death. I listed the events I remembered that seemed important and one thing led to another. Imagine my surprise when an acquaintance told me he had worked at Willowbrook where my sister had been. And then someone gave me this article that appeared.
when I started to add images, that's when the experiences and memories jostled one another. I was recalling long buried occurrences that I had completely forgotten or could never talk about. It turns out that I've been working on this my whole life, that all the paintings and drawings I had done were on some level trying to figure out the clues to the secrets that I was not told about or were trying to find out. An example is when I drew the first frame of the timeline, I noted that when I was three years old, a 12 year old cousin came to visit and tried to have sex with me. Talk about suppressing memory. From then on, I never wanted to go visit that family or see that cousin. But no one ever mentioned it, and I didn't remember. And what about this? Long before he met my mother, my father's father committed suicide. My father never spoke about it. He never mentioned it once. I don't want to give the impression that all the stories on the timeline are sad and full of remorse. While it's true that my family of origin is gone and many of my friends and lovers have departed, in fact, the timeline allowed me to recall and relive many joyful adventures. And I always made art about whatever was happening. And my subject matter, women's lives and the attempt to make meaning out of a world that often appears chaotic. When I started doing the timeline, I had no idea what the final form would be. It would have to be some kind of sequential narrative. I was invited to make new work for a show. It was the perfect opportunity to do something from the timeline. I gathered all the stories and looked at all the drawings. It was clear that the time had come for me to bring them together into some form that would make sense. Big surprise when it turned out that the ambivalence was almost crippling to make the private public whatever anxiety or tension I might have had preparing for an exhibit and experimenting with new technology. This was completely overwhelming. This is the piece that was in the show. It's paper and folded and printed and beautiful. Uh, and it's the beginning of what will be. Here you could see the size of it. So this is the sequence of images for the piece, Family Secrets. It's a glimpse of what the work will be like as I continue with this. The last image of the piece is of my mother looking very pensive and hands using an eraser shield to try to make something perfect. So the alarm that one feels at facing difficult subject matter, I think is something that we all share. I know that we all work very hard doing difficult things and I wish you all support and love and courage. That's true. Wow. That's really yeah. compelling. Very, so, very powerful. Yeah. There, there was a, there's some wonderful synchronicity. When I said that I met somebody who, who worked at Willowbrook, what's the likelihood of that? Now, some of you, if you're on the East Coast or you're from America, you would be familiar. Willowbrook was, was the place that Geraldo Rivera revealed as being a horrible place. And there was a documentary made about it years and years ago, and then a few more. And basically, I wasn't able to deal with it yet, but I started to, over the years, address the issue. And I wanted to explain, I wanted to tell about one wonderful um, synchronicity. I, if you remember, there was an article that I said someone gave me 
about this. So this is an example of how I feel. Oh, by the way, the reason I made this video was uh, I am involved with what's called graphic medicine. Uh, it's a they publish they published a book of mine. Penn State Press published this book called um, Life Support Invitation to Prayer, and it's a, a it's a graphic memoir of my mother's life and death. And I was supposed to go to a conference there last summer, and because of COVID, I couldn't go. But I wrote, I made it as a kind of remote presentation, the, the video, which is where I'm wishing people well and saying, we're all working on this hard stuff. That's who I was talking to. But everybody who sees it thinks I'm talking to them because I think everybody does hard work in their life, basically. Anyway, there's this newspaper article and I had it up on my bullet on the timeline. I put it in the video, but I never wrote to the person who wrote it. Her name is um, Jennifer Natalia Fink. I don't, you know, and I looked and I saw it said she teaches at Georgetown, uh, Director of Disability Studies Program. And after a year, I'm moving on with the project. I'm going to get going. And I write her a letter. I write her, you know, I track her down on email. I get a letter back from her telling me she appreciated the thing and what she could, you know, she has a book. She told me a book. And then she said, by the way, are you the mother of Noah, who I was friends with in junior high school? It turns out that she was good friends with my daughter, Noah, and had slept at my house. They used to have sleepovers. I didn't remember. I mentioned it to my son and he said, yeah, Jenny Fink, I remember her, you know. So what's the <laughs> likelihood of that, really? And then the thing is, I was applying for a grant so that I could do research about Willowbrook this coming summer. And, you know, Grant, you got to get somebody who knows something. And she's going to write a, she wrote a letter of recommendation for me. So, but just when I needed that to happen, that happened. So I'm really grateful about those things. And I, I, I consider that not random chance, I guess. Um, yeah, go ahead. go ahead. No, I was just going to say, um, Judith, did, were you involved with the women's uh, feminist group that used to do studio critiques back in the, 90s were you a participant then were you in new york then? uh no in new york i was i wasn't living there then i okay. lived i we, we were in ithaca for six years and i used to go down to manhattan a lot i left new york in um oh gosh really a long time ago okay, okay. 69. Right. I just, I, <laughs> yeah but i, I visited don't... i haven't been there i haven't been there you know okay. part I of the don't country. know why but I feel like I feel like I met you at some point I don't know why but I do but maybe not well I um, write for a magazine called uh, it's a journal of Jewish women's studies and gender issues so I'm published in that regard and I'm around um maybe we met where do you live maybe well, I'm currently living now in St. Petersburg Florida but I lived uh in on the on the Jersey side in Jersey City and I was basically working in New York every day for so 26 years. Wow. <laughs> and now I'm not there yeah. <laughs> anyway. But uh, I, I was just going to say I was very moved by the secrets idea because we're discovering suddenly some things. And, you know, when a person dies, like this is my aunt who died. And then there's these letters that you find and the letters to my mother type of thing. And there's a lot of dark secrets on the, this is on the Bernstein side, not on the Rheingold side, but the Bernstein side. And it's just very interesting to find out things later in life and then think about uh, how they affected you earlier in life. And I have a brother who is a, a rabbi and went very religious and the rest of the family is not. And, um, Although I have a sister who uh, is involved in a reform uh, mm -hmm. temple in, in Galveston, Texas, of all places. But mm -hmm. that whole thing where the family is and religion, bringing the religion in and then not being religious and all of the tensions that go on between mm -hmm. the religious versus the not religious. Yep. And it was interesting that you asked the question like is anybody gonna it, were there images I couldn't show mm -hmm. on this uh, uh thing and only a religious at one time person would think of that question 
Exactly. Uh, in an artist. Well, group. it depends on where you show. Like at the, that exhibit that I, the, the piece that I showed, the Family Secrets piece, it was shown in a gallery in Jerusalem of a college gallery. But because it was in Jerusalem, we had to show like the video. I, I had to hide some things. Um, there's yeah. so much. You know, well, that's that's understandable. But I'm thinking I'm, in a Zoom session with amongst artists, you're in you're I into understand. the public. I yeah. understand. Uh, I have a website, and um, I've had it for a long time. And I have some of my work is could be said as Judaica. I have a book for counting the Omer. Mm -hmm. I have book that's, that's I have I have work that's absolutely di di directed to let's say religious observance. But I also have the other stuff. So for a long time, I had two two websites. And at one point when I was expanding, oh. making a much better website, and I was getting kind of more like, this is who I am. Uh, I just said, okay, I have one website and I have a toggle at the beginning of it and it's called not suitable for work. And you could click that and then all the nudes are taken away. <laughs> and um, when and when I, when I did uh -huh. my website, I, I sent it to my daughter who was, at, she teaches at Penn State. She was working at Penn State and she's in an office. And I said, I finished my website. This is one of the reasons I did it, not just because of religious people. And it's not just Jews. I mean, you know, there's all sorts of yeah. people who don't uh, necessarily want new. There are concerns. There are concerns that you have, but it makes me think of a great idea. Imagine yeah. you do a drawing of a nude and, you know, you do this drawing, but it's got a button. And you could say, if you're under 13, press this button. Yeah, and then you it's press the button. button and there's like clothing on top of the nude, something yeah. generic, maybe potato sack. But, you know, it's like you could change yeah. the drawing so it's suitable to the yeah. people. <laughs> no, but I, I, sent, I sent the website to my daughter. I was so excited and proud of it. She knew I was working on it a long time. And she's and she's she was working in a cubicle in an office with other people. And she said, Mom. You, 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 you know how it work. So that made me think that it was a good idea. I didn't have to worry about whether it was <laughs> pressing anything. It just seemed like a good idea. That's all. We did a, I co-curated a show uh, with Grace Roselli in 96 and it was at Franklin Furnace and it was called Voyeur's Delight. Hmm. And we, Martha, Martha Wilson was so excited because she, she called us up and she goes, the Christian right is picketing on the, you know, on the steps of the, <laughs> Uh, uh, of the of the court and uh, uh, or the Capitol, I think it was. So they were picketing on the Capitol about our show, uh, thinking that we had received an NEA funding, and there was no NEA funding. There was an Andy Warhol funding. There was no NEA funding, so it it really drew this group of people. And it, I mean, it was very. There was a lot of sexually explicit work that was in this show. And it was just interesting how it got out, got there. They, you know, so, and I had my work censored back in, in, uh, in the uh, early nineties when I was doing all these nude bodybuilders, I was doing paintings of nude bodybuilders and they censored in, this was in Buffalo, New York in a gallery. And they said, oh, you know, or, or it was in, I think it was in, in um, hall walls actually. And they had to like, you know, I mean, there's there's always that worry the minute you're out in the public. So it's an interesting thing that you have going on. <laughs> what a lot of work. To do well, that. actually, the most fun is when my kids get together sometimes and talk about my son. We lived in San Francisco and he was in like sixth, seventh grade or kindergarten. I don't know. And he'd bring kids home and they'd walk through my studio. And I remember one of one friend like walked into the wall looking at this, you know, full length picture of portraits of his mother and i don't think it's so cute actually i have to say one one child doesn't mind the other two mm. i yeah, would like to yeah. say just as a logistical thing if if the i can i would like people to be in touch with me if they want and i am happy to follow up with what people are telling me like everybody's saying something and i want to find out more about what uh, i will say yeah First of all, uh, Judith is on uh, Instagram, correct, or Facebook? Is it Facebook? Facebook is the more 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 active, but I'm on both. She's, she's uh, on Judith both. Margolis in, uh, Judith Margolis in Facebook, and my uh, Instagram is S O L E I L. S T period S O L E I L. And you can always reach uh, out to I'll, me. I'll, uh, and, I'll and reach I can, out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'll I'll give her information if anybody needs it. You know, I want to thank you, Judith. You did something that, you know, happens quite a lot. An artist is talking 
And then all of a sudden they share like probably the deepest, hardest part of their life. Uh, and you shared at least two of those. And I, you know, we discussed the role of art and the role of art making. Um, and I think a lot of it, and certainly with Young, is about exploring feelings, feelings that maybe are oppressed or that are in part of the shadow. And I think whenever, you know, we don't have to think about it, but when we're together and when we create work and when we talk, things naturally come out. And I think, I think it was right that that story in the video came up towards the end, after we had gotten to know you, you had expressed mm -hmm. your art. And then, you, you know, you really laid it, you know, out there cold and true and flat. And it, it, there's no way to say it, except that it is, those are two tough experiences that you relate and beyond the word tough. Um, but sometimes experiences, uh, they sort of bind you by our silence and by not looking at them. And that's sort of the long arm of pain. And when we can share it as you do in a book or in a story with us, or however often, or however you do, it somehow, it, I don't want to just say the poison, somehow the poison gets out because it is, it, it is a, it is an experience that you were taken advantage of, that lies were involved and that terrible things happen and that we sometimes need in our art, often for an artist, it's a cathartic experience in some way. And then sometimes it's in a very deep way. And, you, you know, you're touching some experience from your youth um, and it, it's important. And that's how we as a network, we sort of, uh, we feed each other by listening and we make art knowing it will be listened to. And that's part of that sort of telephone game that we play where we connect with each other. And you, you did a big connection there. You had a lot of thoughts. Um, you know, it's funny how you say, you know, you were orthodox, but there's no way but to hear you're a very religious woman. You talk about hands around you, guiding you. You talk about spirits, basically. You talk about synchronicity. Some would say the synchronicity, uh, the spirit sort of directing you. This is a path. Wait a minute. This is not a coincidence. There is something connecting here that you need to look at. So, you know, it, it, it's just funny. You consider yourself not orthodox. And of course, I'm sure we can go into a long discussion about that. But the point <laughs> is, you know, you're, you're a very religious and you got there because of your orthodox upbringing there's no question about that actually i didn't have an orthodox upbringing i became oh there goes that explanation no i i met the <laughs> husband that became orthodox with me we met on a forget it forget about this we were on a we were on a, a commune in southern oregon i i used to say to people I, I saw him naked before i knew his name so uh it just <laughs> happened it just happened but um it's interesting. It's very interesting. It's all. What was his name? Pardon? <laughs> what was his name? His name was David Margolis, and he was a oh, very. Okay. I thought you were going to say Dick or something. <laughs> I think the book no, I... is a, um, a, you know, no, the journal, it really comes out. It, it does lend itself to being because it is, you know, a, a journal. It, it where the personal comes out really strongly. Maybe you wouldn't even do it in other ways, but it's so revealing and deep and sad and wonderful to see that revealed in an artist. And, you know, I always appreciate the courage that it takes to share things like that. I have my own journals. I don't know whether I'd want to or feel comfortable sharing them. And I, I think I appreciate that you're you're willing to do that, Judith, especially when there is so much pain involved and in that, you know, and but I think it is, again, a good, um, it's such a wonderful way to uh, shine light on the kind of things that happen in our lives. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm drawn to deeply personal work. And that was a great first iPhone movie. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I enjoyed the whole thing um, and strong, powerful stuff. Thanks. Judith, do you find that um, when you share these deeply personal things that the hurt inside diminishes? 
tell you the truth, it's very interesting. The hurt or look at uh, the, the, the video. I, I joked with somebody and said every single, you know, it was relatively little words and, and, and images. Mm -hmm. One of those frames represents decades of therapy. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Like if I, yeah. if I have a picture and I say secrecy or privacy, <laughs> we got 10 years of therapy right there. If I talk you know, <laughs> about my cousin, I mean, I didn't even remember. Remember? I didn't right. remember. Um, I'm very proud of the drawings, particularly that I do. And I've, I always drew. And um, when I'm showing them, like my experience tonight, when I was showing it to you, I didn't think at all about the topic. I'm, I, like, it's not heavy for me tonight. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm gonna be continuing on this work now and I, and I have to brace myself and I'm terrified of it. I have to think about what, did, what, what was it like for my mother? What was it like for my father? But when I'm showing it to you, I'm thinking, oh, I hope they noticed that drawing. And did you see the, <laughs> the, uh, the uh, dollhouse drawing? I, did, I made a dollhouse for my daughter. The, the, she's 45 now, but... <laughs> and I used to leave it after the kids would play with it. I draw what they left. And so that oh. image was what kids do with it. With but I did that years ago, way before I, I used it for this. This is the part that I'm most excited about, about the work I'm doing. And because I'm older, I'm, I'm, I'm going back and finding all my old work and I'm find, finding ways to put it together in new ways. Mm -hmm. Things that I forgot about. I mean, I have tons and tons of stuff. So um I, you know, and I'm, when I say I'm older, I'm 78. So I'm kind of moving towards, that's close to 80. And not, and yeah, yeah. Happy. You obviously, <laughs> that's like, you have oh, a, a pact with the devil. You look so good. <laughs> I like drugs and rock and roll, we say. Um, <laughs> the, the truth is, I have this story to tell and I want to get it done. I want to get it done. And being able to use all those drawings that I have, and all the art and it's, it's like, it's coming back again. It's for new things that I'm very excited about that. And I'm finding that a lot of people I know who are older are, are if they were lucky enough to hold on to what they did. I'll give you an example, a drawing that I hated when I did it in 1976. <laughs> Literally, I was, I was sickened by it, but I didn't throw it away. And now I take it out and I say, oh my God, this was about that. I didn't know mm -hmm. what it was about. When you when somebody said something about uh, secrets, it wasn't that people lied to me even, they just, nobody mentioned it, but children know, children know what's right. going on. In the, and so that, all of that stuff is opening up a whole world of, um, I'm just interested in it. Yeah, and, but a lie, a lie by omission is still a lie. Exactly. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Actually, when I did the timeline, um, so my mother gave away my sister when, when she was pregnant with me. I figured it out when I was six or seven years old that, that she was my sister. We used to visit this child in the hospital and I figured out she was my sister. Nobody said anything. If someone said to my mother, how many children do you have? She'd say two. Yeah. Which, that by the time I was six or seven years old, I knew she was lying. When yeah. I did the timeline and I saw, you know, I got pregnant my friends were having abortions, things, different things were going on. And I, re and I thought to myself, what do people lie about? What do people lie about? That became, that kind of opened up a lot of what I was doing. And I added other people's stories. I mean, you couldn't see too much. The, there's one room in my, in my studio. I have a, a three bedroom apartment and the whole place is my studio. So one room is direct, is completely devoted to the timeline and to this project and all the collage stuff and everything. And it's in the back. And, and at least for the first two years, nobody went in that room. I didn't show anybody. And to this day, I didn't invite my son in either. <laughs> he, saw the, he saw the video, but uh, he, you know, he, didn't have to, he didn't have to see that <laughs> yet. <laughs> so. I, I always, oh, sorry. I always think about like these secrets, like in my family, my grandmother's twin sister had bipolar. And so they put her in an institution and it was just like, she disappeared. But, yes. you know, when you think about it, um, I'm 58. So my generation is the first one who we can say in public, I'm going to therapy. 
you know, before it was like this taboo thing you didn't say. And so you didn't want people to know that you had that in your bloodline. I don't know if that's a good word or not, but you know what I mean? Because people yeah, wouldn't, sure. Absolutely. you were like a defective family, basically. Down syndrome. Yeah, you know, exactly. And so I you have planned marriages, you know, uh, arranged marriages. Exactly. Let people know that that exists. Yes, that's exactly. They yeah, I mean, two, so bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, two generations. There's still, there's still a lot of stigma around it. I think there's still a lot of stigma around it. I mean, I went to a neurologist when I was so sick in 2008, and he wanted to know all about my mom. Somehow, you know, the moment I tell him my mother had mental issues and all of her check ins to the hospitals. The next thing you know, he's like diagnosing me like I'm her. I mean, it was it was pretty screwed up, actually. Uh -huh. And, uh, right. you know, so I think there is still a lot of stigma around that. And I never tell anybody anymore. None of their damn business, honestly. It's like well, that's true, too. It's, yeah, I think for me, it's I, a way to you know, be transparent. Doc, but but well, every time you go to the doctor, they want to know, well, have, are you feeling depressed or you didn't, you know, these yes. are the questions now that they're asking. And I'm just going, I don't think I'm telling you <laughs> anything. <laughs> well, I guess I feel like it's a way to be accepting of yourself. That's maybe why I say that, you know, tell people things like that is because yeah. it's me. Um, Cause I think secrets have shame to them too. And so yeah. to not be ashamed is a really big step to be kind of like, F you, this is something that's part of who I am, but it makes me, I don't know, I, I hate to say it, but it makes yeah. me magnificent, you know? So yeah. I, I came across these uh, seven quotes from Albert Einstein that we you would never believe Einstein said. And it's to your point, Babs, it was things like, don't tell other people your secrets. Don't <laughs> tell other people your problems. It's just the opposite of what we've learned the last 60 years about right, getting right. it out. And, right. you know, whenever Einstein says anything, you really listen a little more closely. Um, and he, they do explain it as if you tell people your weaknesses, they'll often use it against you. So it's more of a right. prag pragmatic view. And if you tell somebody... Right something bad about yourself, they'll think less of you. And so there's this gamemanship that he's coming from, not from a sort of a full mental health attitude, where I think it's best to share and to get things out, to be aware and not hide. But well, it, it was fascinating. Yeah, but this was, an instant, this was in an instance that a doctor used it against me and then put the report to another doctor. And I was trying to get you know, my case solved of having, I mean, I had lost 10 pounds. I was having horrible intestinal problems. I had all these problems and he's telling me I'm a fucking hypo hypochondriac. I mean, yes. this is, and he sent that note to my gastro doctor who was a, a great Jewish doctor. And he says, and so was the other <laughs> the one who was by the way, orthodox, which was really fascinating. But he was a neurologist and a psychologist. And my gastro says, by the way, the the you know the neurologist said that you're a hypochondriac. He put this in your chart. Your charts. And next thing uh -huh. you know, you got this stuff in your chart. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? It's the old syndrome of little skinny Jewish woman. Nothing's wrong with her. She's either having panic attacks or she's you know a hypochondriac. Man, I, it's like okay, I'm a successful artist. I've done all these things, but suddenly this year. I'm a friggin' hypochondriac and it pissed me off. And I've never told another doctor again. <laughs> it's none of their damn business. <laughs> no, it's very important to keep your secrets. Uh, and then this is just keep it secret. <laughs> but don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. <laughs> the artist's definitely, way. Definitely the, the, the dangers of labels. You can see yeah. that the dangers of yes. being produced. And the doctor's grabbing for a la label so he can make a diagnosis. And so, yeah, it's, 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 a I little... read, a, I read those, you know, those cases where they can't, can't solve them and then they finally solve them, the New York yeah. Times said. And they did that to this one woman and it was freaking years. And she finally got a damn diagnosis and everybody told her she was, you know, whatever the hell it was. And because she had drank, they said, well, it was because she's an alcoholic. And she had like 
real symptoms that they finally got to the bottom of. You know, this is the problem with labels. It's one thing to t tell your friends. I mean, it, like I've just told you, my mother had issues. You know, she was in and out of mental institutions. There's a lot of crazies in my mother's side of the family, all of them. So that suddenly makes me the crazy. You know, when you walk into a doctor's office, it's a problem. This mm -hmm. is a problem. <laughs> mm -hmm. By the way, Babs, just to keep it simple, next time when you refer to a Jewish psychiatrist, you don't have to use the uh, double reinforcement. It's sort of understood when you say a doctor that it is a Jewish doctor. <laughs> well, you have, to, you have to understand. This is like you know, I'm I'm I, I I you know in in Florida. So now it's like I don't necessarily get all the Jewish doctors. Although there's a few here. <laughs> But you have to ask, is it a doctor, is he, a, he or she a doctor, doctor, or a dentist, doctor? <laughs> is it a doctor, a doctor, a doctor, a uh, uh, philosopher? Right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you all. Yeah. Thank, thanks all right. for chiming in. Thanks so much, yeah. to Judith, for staying up well past Tuesday there. I had a really good thank time. You. I got a little nervous beforehand, but it was really fun. It came um, off good. Oh, yes, go ahead. Tuesday is also you're going to do it? Yes. Next Tuesday, in fact, Larry, who was uh, here and had a left to one of our regulars, he's going to present to yes, if he could. I'll remind him, yes, Great. about his Bronx stories. Um, and so that should sort of be interesting. So it is every Tuesday, although the following one after the 21st, I will be away. Judith, thank you for your time. Thanks thank for you. this together. And uh, Mary, Jenna, everybody, all the regulars, Wendy, thank Michael. You know. Tabs and of course David and uh, Mo for modeling. Uh, thank you, Nancy, of course, and Judith Green for joining us. Um, this will be up on YouTube in a few days. Days. The last talk we did, I put it up on YouTube. It already got about 170 views. So some of the YouTubes do get a bunch of views. Um, feel free to you know use it to help promote yourself, Judith. And again, you know your art. You you had a lot in your artwork. You had a lot. Um, we can only get to the surface of it. We could have dove into your symbols and what they mean to you. I did want to open up, but I won't do it now. When you had, uh, you mentioned having an, uh, I think it was not adversarial relationship, but a uh, sort of a argumentative relationship with both uh, your spouse and then also with God. I think you mentioned that, and I, I that, that's for another time. But would love, <laughs> I, I would definitely love to hear how that conversation went, what are the thoughts? But we'll, we'll leave that for another time. Thank you all for coming. And uh, this was great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judith. Thank great you. To, great to meet you. I'll be in touch. Okay, bye. See you next time.